On this channel, last I checked, I usually build PCs, so why am I doing the exact opposite of that? Well, I've purchased this supposed i5 3rd gen for a decent price, complete apart from the RAM, and the seller assures me that it does indeed work. I should mention that I have no idea what CPU is lurking in this PC, but I'm rather convinced that it is not a 3rd gen Core i5, mostly because it's an H110M board with DDR4. So that rules out any 3rd gen completely to the best of my knowledge, as well as 4th and 5th gen CPUs, leaving only 6th and 7th gen as contenders, because even though 8th gen used the same socket, it was a different revision. Anyway, it comes in this squat case that has a window geared towards showing off your GPU and segregating case airflow. I'm not a massive fan, but I think we should try to oblige with a good looking GPU nonetheless. In here I also found a 1TB hard drive, which I subsequently tested and it was all okay. A Corsair 430 watt PSU that I also bench tested and found to be in good working order, a couple of fans that while dusty are running nice and silent and well th that's about it. And now it's time to find out what CPU is hiding underneath that rather dated arctic heatsink. As a side note, this style of cooler mounting mechanism is probably one of my least favorite. Sure, it technically is somewhat user friendly, and some of the smaller heatsinks like this one should be alright. There are firms that produce 4 or even 6 heat pipe tower coolers and expect people to mount them with these plastic prongs. And that with no backplate nothing, just the motherboard and slim plastic clips. So so after removing the heatsink and the thermal compound, the CPU is finally revealed to be the i5-6600 and while I'm happy with it, I must admit I was still harboring an ember hope that it might be the K variant even though it would have made little sense on this motherboard. Still, this is a 14nm 4 core and 4 thread Skylake processor, so I'm not complaining. I continued with the disassembly until every component was out and then I proceeded to clean everything thoroughly. When a case is this dusty, I usually remove all the components I can, plus any switches that are easy enough to remove or that are not glued down and I give it a good rinse with water, as I'm afraid there really isn't any other good hope of getting all that dust out of the filter sponges. At this point it's been a good few days. I sourced the GPU I think will fit with this build very nicely and tested all the components until I was satisfied that everything was in order. All that is left now is to put everything back together. And we start with the heatsink and a new layer of thermal compound. As a rule I just dump it on and put the heatsink on leaving to take out care of the spreading, but I noticed that this particular one is rather poor so I decided to use Arctic MX5, put it on a bit more thickly than I would normally do, cover the whole heat spreader. I decided to reuse the same heat sink for two reasons. One, this is a lock process so even this no thrills cooler can keep it up around 60C which is well below its TJ Maxx. And second, I don't actually have an air cooler that fits 1151 on hand with the only other option being a Corsair H60 which would be silly overkill. And speaking of overkill, the memory kit. A 16GB 2x8 Corsair 3000 Mega Transfer Second RAM kit. Why overkill you ask? Because regardless of the memory rate and speed, this CPU can only handle 2133 mega trans per second and no more. No obligatory peel later, and while I install this, I should explain that there is no way to actually enable XMP on this board. And even if I swapped it for a Z series board, it will still not work at its rated speed. Since I don't have a lower rated kit in my inventory at the moment, this will have to do. One thing I do like about this case is the fact that the motherboard tray detaches. A necessary tray given that with most screwdrivers one would not be able to easily install the motherboard and cooler otherwise. And with the motherboard in position it's high time to meet the star of the show, GPU that would sit pretty in the aforementioned window, an AMD R9290 from Sapphire with a trike fan cooler. This GPU will get its own dedicated video soon with this assembly, cleaning, repaste and benchmarks in my normal benchmarking PC with the 5950X and 64 gigs of RAM. We'll have a lot more to say about the GPU both in the benchmarking portion of this video as well as its separate one. But for now let's continue this build by adding a Corsair GS650W power supply to the mix. This is a serious 
upgrade over the one this PC came with, but it is very much necessary to feed that very power hungry old top tier card. SSD is a 240 gig Dr. Evo or Drevo or whatever they like to call themselves X1. I used this in the past and does exactly what it says on the tin. I had to use one of those silly plastic 3.5 inch 2.5 inch adapters because I don't believe this case came with any 2.5 inch drive base and combined with the toolless hard drive holder it's a bit of a plastic sandwich but it seems to work all right. Next the hard drive goes in and it is a 500 gigabyte Seagate that passed all C tools tests and should be good enough to hold some lesser used stuff. There are still two 3.5 inch bays in here so there is enough expansion if required. And finally with all the drives in it is time to tackle the cable management properly. It's a surprisingly difficult job in this case, I thought it would be far easier to tuck everything out of sight but with the front IO and buttons cramming right in front of the GPU it's a bit of a pain to get it looking slick. But with the impetus that only frustration can provide here is the final result. And now onto the BIOS. I thought long and hard about whether or not I should update the BIOS on this board because it came with version F1, namely the release BIOS, which contrary to Intel's wishes had the option to base clock overclock. But that would have meant giving up on multiple microcode updates plus security patches. Base clock overclocking really isn't my cup of tea, well not since the top dog in the processor world was an FX of the Athlon variety, so in the end I uh, closed off that avenue and upgraded. Funny enough, it now gives the option to enable XMP, which puzzled me to then dash all hopes when it became apparent that the only thing it will do is raise the RAM voltage while keeping the speed and timings unchanged. There are also multiple overclocking toggles in this version of BIOS but rest assured they are all placebos with the CPU only boosting as far as Intel intended. I usually have a fixed benchmark order, but this time I wanted to start with Horizon Zero Dawn, mostly because this happens to be the first benchmark I ran and my jaw promptly dropped to the floor. I haven't compared the R9 with any other cards until now, sure I briefly owned one circa 2015 for a couple of weeks and more recently I've been trying to score one from CX but they keep running out, so my memory from back then is fuzzy at best and initially I did not even want to test the GPU on its own merit. But and that bot carries a lot. After running Horizon Zero Dawn and getting a 49 FPS result, I was annoyed thinking I messed up the settings because that is 3 FPS faster than a 970 and 2 FPS slower than an RX 570. All of this on a card that was released four and a half years prior and there are two whole generations of GPUs between them, mainly the 300 and 400 series. So I went back, rechecked the settings and re-ran the benchmark and then is when it hit me. This card is rather good and it has to contend with the fact that it's built on a 28 nanometer manufacturing process while the 500 series is 40 nanometer. I knew right then I need to test this in my main machine so stay tuned for that video and my thoughts on it. Heaven is an older benchmark but it is very much still relevant because it pushes all GPUs up their upper utilization limits. It's doubly impressive when you consider that 81.6 FPS is only 6 FPS behind the RX 570. But what about the iGPU in this build? I tested plenty of Ryzen's iGPUs and recommended them as stop gaps until DGPUs are more readily available, so why not this one? Well, because it's realistically only good for 2D desktop use, with the 12.1 FPS average in heaven driving the point home hard. Superposition, which is a much newer benchmark, the story gets even better with the R9 only being 1 FPS slower than the RX 570, something I am happy to chuck up to margin of error. This is when something else not so pleasant dawned on me as well, that this isn't even the top of the range R9 290X model and it functionally identical with the upper mid range from 3 generations removed, meaning that AMD went through a fair few years of very brutal GPU stagnation that wasn't truly broken until the RDNA hit the scene. I've said many times that I want to drop Rocket League from the benchmarks and this is a prime example as to why. The afterburner overlay simply would not work and while the gameplay was nice and smooth, actual FPS was only hovering around 80 at max 1080p, which is a full 40% down of where it I was expecting it to be based on this GPU alone, so be no doubt that this is purely a CPU bottleneck. 
I can't be bothered to find out why or what exactly was bought this time. I really need to find an esports replacement, thinking of getting LOL or Dota 2 for the second esports title. Fortnite ran well at Full HD Epic with about 48 FPS on average, but I know everyone will turn the settings down to medium and the draw distance to Epic. For some reason I had a bit of trouble with the settings, the game would not allow me to change some of them, but after a bit of back and forth we eventually got there. The main bottleneck here is the processor and not the GPU so that 124 FPS average I am sure can be improved. Regardless it is a respectable result for the vast majority of Fortnite players. Cyberpunk exhibited signs of both CPU and GPU limitations depending on the scenario so I would say that they are somewhat evenly matched running with 39 FPS on average with medium to high settings. The lows were mostly caused by the CPU hitting 100% utilization before the GPU though. Please don't forget that these are my standard settings so there is more than enough room to lower the settings and or the resolution. A bit of tinkering and maybe a community patch, 60 FPS is doable but I personally would stick to about 50 with a bit more eye candy at 1080p with something like 80% resolution scale. The fact that you can play and most importantly enjoy this title on a PC that costs about the same as a Reefer Blast Gen PS4 Pro or way less than half of a PS5 is in my opinion amazing. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla we saw an average of 43 FPS and I'm sure it can do better paired with a beefier CPU. Regardless, this PC should have no business running such a demanding game at high settings but here we are not only running it but doing it rather well. By way of comparison, the RX 480 managed an average of 49 FPS and the RX 570 50 but both would pair with much higher than processor, a 3600 XT and a 2700X respectively. And yes, I am aware that 1% and 0.1% lows are a thing, but also the fact that they are more representative of a CPU performance than the GPU. Phoenix Rising is a game built on the same engine as Assassin's Creed and a little bit less optimized than that. Running at 1080p returned 38 FPS, but the cartoonish graphics do make it look good regardless of the video set. In days gone on 1080p, this GPU is doing an amazing job, just can't fault it. The problem here is the CPU that is pegged at 100% and produces some gnarly frame time spikes. Usually I would just increase the resolution or settings to ba get back on a GPU bottleneck, but that would not do any good here as the CPU produces micro stutters. Going to 900p though completely alleviates the issue and while the CPU is still the one holding everything back with the frame rate staying mostly the same, the frame times have calmed down making it playable. I need to come clean here and say that this is the first build I ever did that was not a joke like pairing a 3200G with an RX 3080 that is so unequivocally CPU limited. Now I would be remiss if I did not talk about the CPU for a moment on its own. I already mentioned that the 3000 mega transfer SEPA memory kit is unfortunately completely wasted here since it can only run at 2133 but even so it manages to match a 3200G, a CPU that is a whopping 4 years newer. Posted a score within 10 points of the former in Cinebench R20 making the two CPUs virtually interchangeable in my opinion in terms of the number crunching abilities. RAM speed isn't such a massive issue in Cinebench but there are other applications that do favor the 3200G a bit more pronounced, most of the improvements coming from the extra memory bandwidth. This build has managed to repeatedly surprise me and every time in a good way and all the more notable considering that this is the first Intel build that I did on the channel. But there is one more elephant in the room that needs to be addressed and that is the imminent driver support discontinuation from AMD. Yes, it's true that this card will not receive future driver updates, but it is not a disaster a lot of people make it out to be. It just means that over the course of the next few years, performance in, and I stress this means only in newer titles, will not be as good as it otherwise would have been, after driver development ceases completely in August of 2021. I generally prefer to build PCs that are more upgradable than this one, but there are cases where someone might be holding out for the next big thing and just wants a proper stopgap or simply 
knows that this is the upper limit that they can spend on a machine for the foreseeable future and in such cases I will be prepared to live with the performance this GPU and system overall provides in the here and now versus the price. After all, no matter how you look at it, for around a third less money it wipes the floor with the 3400G system that is relying on its iGPU. Besides, as we have seen, the main bottleneck in most instances is the CPU, so there is some room for an upgrade with an i7 down the line being a welcome change. And that's about this for this video. Thank you very much for watching and hope to see you all in the next one.